Hey everyone, it's me, Arthur Cade, welcoming the brilliant and hilarious Jen Lancaster to Behind the Velvet Rope. Make sure to check out her awesome new book, The Best of Enemies, one of my favorite interviews, just an awesome, awesome lady. Check it out. Hey everyone, it's me, Arthur Cade, and few people have ever made me laugh more than you, Jen Lancaster. I'm so happy to have you back. You have this really cool new book called The Best of Enemies. I started laughing because I was just on the red carpet for a new documentary called The Best of Enemies, and it was about Gore Vidal and William Buckley and their debates. Yours is not about Gore Vidal and William Buckley. Yours is about just people who reunite and are the best of enemies. Talk to me all about it. I'm so sorry for anyone who picks up this book and thinks it's about smart people things. I really <laughs> am. It's about two women who despise each other and keep getting thrown back together to help their mutual best friend. It's not about Gore Vidal, not even a little bit. <laughs> I love it. The best sales pitch ever. I hope whoever buys this book doesn't think it's about smart subjects. <laughs> <laughs> There's your tagline. Forget needing publicists. No, I just did it. No, congrats. So this is, again, new line, obviously, uh, in the long line of your books. What was the inspiration behind writing this? Well, every time I write a book, there's sort of a backlash to whatever I write next. The last time I saw you, I was talking about the Tao of Martha. And I had a hat on, by the way. That, that I made for you. That, you made. that was outstanding. <laughs> was crazy. So if you like crappy knit goods, talk to me three <laughs> years ago. Um, so I spent a year of my life living by Martha Stewart's dictates. What held over from that was I was starting to try to live this Pinterest perfect life. And that's, I don't know, that's kind of false. And the more I thought about that, the more I thought, about these, you know, a lot of these mommy bloggers, these lifestyle bloggers who try to live these these lives that are photo perfect. They try to live these lives like like magazines. And I started to think of a character. And I thought, what would be what would be the antithesis antithesis of this character? And I thought, well, what about a foreign correspondent? They would despise each other. They would hate each other so much. What would be a situation that I could put them in where they would constantly come into contact with each other because conflict drive books drives books so I put them in conflict with each other over this mutual best friend so they can't get away from each other every time they get together it is a rumble in the jungle whether it's a bachelorette party a wedding they were originally college roommates and they just despise each other can't get away from each other and that's what this whole book is mysterious circumstances happen they end up on this epic road trip and they may or may not end up killing each other on it. You don't know. You have to read the book. Best of frenemies. I love it. You mentioned the whole Pinterest perfect life. I'm so, this is such a sore subject for me because you go on Facebook, you go on Pinterest, you go on Instagram. Everybody is living the perfect life. People think I live the perfect life because I get to talk to people like you and movie stars and whoever else. And it's like, we, none of us live the perfect life. So when you were kind of trying to live this perfect life, what'd you figure out? I think that you have to put up what's real because otherwise you're going to make people feel bad. You don't want people to look at your pictures and resent you. You care about you know? making people feel bad. I, love I, I don't <laughs> want people to feel bad. I really don't. I mean, so sometimes when neat things happen to me, I keep it to myself. That's the line from broadcast news. That's something that I play in my head over and over again. What is what is the exact line? I think it's said to um, William Hurt. What happens when your real life exceeds your dreams? Keep it to yourself. And Facebook is the antithesis to that. Keep it to yourself. Do you ever get annoyed by those people, though? Like, I totally, I get, where I get annoyed is the relationships. When people who are in relationships have to flaunt their relationships. And I just sit there and I'm like, they hate each other. They have to literally sell their relationship on Facebook to pretend like they actually like each other. Overcompensation. You know they're overcompensating. Yeah, show me, show me your picture of your husband with your arms around you in Maui one more time. Because you know, the minute you turn around, he's texting his girlfriend. FYI. <laughs> That's what I think. So you write this book. And obviously, w one of the great things about you as a writer and in person, because you match it, is your humor. Talk to me about bringing the humor to the situation. This book was so much fun to write because these two characters were so diametrically opposed. There's one scene in this book that I was, I, well, I 
my goal is always to make myself laugh. So these two women are very nerdy in their own ways. Both of them are in their late 30s. There's a scene where they have to go hunt down information. And I think the the gap between women who are in their 20s and women who are in their 30s and enormous, beyond, enormous. enormous. Well, they have to go to this club and they have to blend in at this club and neither one of them is very good at this. So they have to put on their club clothes um, and, and try to blend in with these kids. And it is just a comedy of errors with them in their little tight dresses, trying to speak in, um, in, trying to speak like 20 year olds. And finally, the mommy blogger tells the foreign war correspondent she's only allowed to say three things, OMG, WTF, and sucks to be you. Those are the only three things she's allowed to say. <laughs> Otherwise, she's going to blow, she's going to blow their cover. So it is a super fun scene. And they also try to buy drugs. And nobody understands the metric system. <laughs> so it is it is probably the most fun I have ever had as a writer picturing this. And it this has to be made into a movie just so somebody makes this scene. And if it's Tina Fey and Amy Poehler, please God. As you were saying that, I'm literally casting it in my head thinking who could play these parts. And, and this is a bad combination because their movie didn't do so well. But it was Sofia Vergara and Reese Witherspoon just had this... This road comedy, but it didn't do so great. But I rented it for the plane. We'll see what happens. <laughs> you had just made me think of something, which was last night I was actually thinking of you. I ended up watching this documentary on J.D. Salinger. It's called Salinger. Amazing documentary. And I, I'm like a loser. I go home. I watch Netflix. This was my night last night. But the... the I thing, go home and I put costumes on my dogs. I mean, let's let's loser that's more is relative. Action, that's yeah, but like you're married, you have a life. I watch, I do this, and I watch Netflix. Horrible. But the Salinger, one of the things that blew my mind was he. This guy was such a recluse, and he lived with these characters that he created. These characters were to him as real as family, friends. He had no friends, but family. Do you have that same connection with your characters when you're writing these people? Because you're like, hey, I had a ton of fun writing these two characters. How much of a connection, how much do you live with these characters? With these two characters in particular, I I really did have a connection with them. I keep referencing them and thinking, oh, I should call... No, honey, they're not real. <laughs> they're not real. And I, I've been asked a couple times over the course of this book, which which character do you identify with more? And in each of my novels before this, I have created these protagonists who are sort of unlikable. And I wanted to create someone finally who was likable, and that is the character Jack. She's very noble. She's very pure. Her, her intentions are always very good. And of course, I relate to Kitty, who is very selfish, who is very vapid, who is very self-involved. So it just figures. What can I say? But yeah, I, I want them to be real. I really do. And I want her, um, Jack's brothers to be real. I really want these characters to exist. Are they children to you? And this, again, going back to the Salinger documentary, these characters were children to him. He held them so sacred. When you're writing this, and I guess it's from a process standpoint, like he would lock himself in his bunker in New Hampshire and you wouldn't see him for two weeks. When you're going through your process, and I actually wouldn't know what your process is, how much do these characters not just become a part of you, but are you able to let go of them once the book is done? I started, towards the end, having trouble letting bad things happen to them because I cared about them. That's and interesting. That's, that is difficult. It, I was having trouble letting go. I was having trouble in some of the action scenes letting, letting bad things happen. And that's not great as a writer. <laughs> I, so I, now I have to go back to memoir and let bad things happen to myself. <laughs> Who are some of the authors that you look up to? Like, I just had Jackie Collins in here, and I was just sitting Isn't here. Isn't she the best? The best. And you know what was cool? Like, we've had Jackie in here multiple times, but I interviewed Joan for the first time, Ooh. who you sit, stand there, and you're like, if you were to define fabulousness, there's fabulousness, that woman. But I remember looking at her, and I'm like, there's probably so many authors, both female and male, who have built careers emulating you. Who are some of the people that have inspired you? Oh, number one, Jennifer Weiner. I met her at a book signing in 2005. She was so kind. She was so generous. You remind me of, you guys remind me of each other. I love that. You guys are funny in 
the literal sense, but also hilarious in real life. It matches on both ends. Well, I've gotten to hang out with her a she number does. of times. Um, well, just one of the things that I said to her, to to her, to myself when I met her in two thousand five, is if I ever have a chance to to pay it forward, I'm going to because she was so great, and she's someone who continues to be great to new authors. She's someone who continues to support um, other authors. Emily Giffen is wonderful. Here, here you would think these women who are at the top of their game would have nothing to gain by being kind to other authors. I think um, I think Ellen Hildebrand is wonderful. I love Mary. Kate Andrews. Uh, I think Alison Wynn Scotch is terrific. Um, I'm reading a wonderful book by Taylor Jenkins Reid right now. Really, there is such a sisterhood in in the the whole female author community. And what I think is interesting is most of these women, or a, a good deal of them, were women who are in sororities. So the whole sisterhood thing kind of extends. It's so fascinating. I never even thought of that. Do you guys ever run work? Because you were saying that your work when you're thinking about funny, it has to make you chuckle. Mm -hmm. And from a comedian's perspective, I always am curious how, especially stand-ups, figure out what's funny. And obviously they have to test it on the audiences, and sometimes they bomb, and sometimes it's a hit. For an author, it's got to be so difficult because you have it on paper. It's not like you can just practice it on somebody. How do you know when something's going to work? There are friends that I put stuff in front of to see what they think. And I read it in, I read it to my husband, who doesn't think anything is funny. But if he's like, yeah, that's okay, then, then my God, <laughs> it's the best thing that was ever written anywhere. Because he, he doesn't read my stuff. There was one tour I went on, I don't know, five or six books ago, that he actually started, it was for My Fair Lazy, he actually started reading My Fair Lazy, and then Sebastian Younger's book came out, and he started reading that, because he's like, oh, that's so much better. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but if my husband hears it, because I read everything out loud to him, I read every chapter out loud to him, just to make sure it, it flows, that it sounds conversational, and if he gives me the nod, then I know it is okay. You're awesome. <laughs> that's all I can say. Go buy your new book, The Best of Enemies. I am so... I think what you guys do, and I was, again, watching the Sounder documentary, there is such a process to doing this and to watch what you guys do, especially from a comedic standpoint, people like you and Jen, I'm just like blown away. I can't even imagine writing a short story, let alone the number of books that you heard. The, the, what you guys do is mind blowing to me. So I congrats. Like I do like checks. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. Get, and pay her. Congratulations. Thank you. 